So this is the Michigan Ceremonial Mounds. And the Shabby Gemar. And it is written in Ottawa, Obijwa, and Potawatomi. According to the oral traditions, Ottawa, Obijwa, and Potawatomi once constituted a single people and they had a common culture and common language. After migrating from the North Atlantic coast, the Straits of Mackinac, the original group split into three groups, each assuming its own identity, long before Europeans arrived in the mid 1600s. Known as the Three Fires, the Ottawa, Obijwa, and Potawatomi shared a common principle that influenced their response to the Europeans. All three groups emphasized individual human dignity and believed that no person should determine another's fate. Members of each group relied on one another in the times of need, sharing goods, labor, and food. They also believed in protecting the ecological balance that links all life. To them, the Earth's resources were not meant to be owned or exploited for the exclusive benefit of any individual or group. The lives of the people of the Three Fires were changed forever by the arrival first of French and British explorers, traders, and missionaries, and later American settlers. Traders exchanged cloth, metal tools, and guns for furs. Missionaries sought to convert Indians to the religions of Europe, and after the American Revolution, settlers and the new federal government wanted to title to Indian land. Between 1795 and 1842, the American government made treaties that took almost all the Michigan people's 57,900 square miles of land. In return for their land, the Indians received cash and manufactured goods, and teachers, farmers, and blacksmiths to help them adapt to a new way of life. Indian negotiations also secured the right to continue hunting and fishing on government-owned land as well as access to health care and to pursue public education. In recent years, treaty hunting and fishing provisions have been upheld in landmark court cases determined to maintain a home in the land that was once exclusively theirs. Contemporary Indian leaders continue to battle for their treaty rights and to seek additional compensation for the land their ancestors were compelled to surrender. And here is the map. The original land. This is the original land. These are the years of the treaties. And this is the original Michigan land. And the beautiful Grand Rapids. ceremonial mounds that were talked about in that video These are the mounds that were written about on those plaques.
Now these definitely look like more mound-like structures, but there's three of them. And I can see why the natives would have built them here because this is right by the Grand River of Grand Rapids. International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. So this is a found for the people who built the city. Right next to the ancient mounds of the Native American people. find the entire topic very interesting. I'm going to try and locate the, there's a Native American chief statue somewhere over here, but I don't know where it is, so I gotta try and find it. But yeah, I see why, why they would have built them, right? If these were burial mounds, then this would be easy access to a river and probably aligns with some kind of star system so there's potential for that and if they were more ceremonial just fun mounds like the ones in Cahokia that were were built for the equinoxes then the river would make an excellent source of transportation for the people since this river empties out into Lake Michigan and the rivers were used as a highway system back then by all the native tribes Hopefully I'll find the native statue to show that. So yeah, that's the three mounds. Best way to show them. One, two, and three. Oh, what do you know? There's a plaque for them, too. Okay. The Mound Builders. About 2,000 years ago, mound building people today, often called the Hopewell, lived in the upper Great Lakes region. They settled in Hopewell from villages in the Grand River Valley, gathered beside the river at the rapids to trade, socialize, conduct religious rituals, and construct burial mounds. The remains of important men and women, young and old, were buried beneath the mounds, the largest of which re required nearly 50,000 basket 500,000 basketfuls of dirt and took 10 years to complete. Buried with the dead were ceremonial, ceremonial bowls, weapons, and tools, along with shells, copper, and silver gathered from an extensive trade network. The symbolic mounds in this park represent two of Michigan's most important mound groups. The Converse Mounds, built on the west bank of the Grand River near this location, were leveled in the 1850s by settlers seeking to fill dirt to build streets. The Norton Mounds, downriver near Granville, survived. In 1965, they were declared a National Historic Site. Artifacts from the Norton Mounds are on display at the Grand Rapids Public Museum. Unfortunately, I can't go to the museum to show this, but these are the mounds. Amazing history still preserved that may not be here in the future due to erosion, of course. So, 
I'm very fortunate and lucky to be able to take a video here and document this. So, and to pay my respects to the historical people of the Ottawa, Potawatomi, and the Chippewa because I do live on their land. Oh, as a as an American citizen, I have to respect that I am in on land that used to belong to other people. So, that is why I pursue this history. So, anyway, I'll read this real quick. Ab Nawan Bicentennial Park. This name was officially adopted July 14 through 15, 1979, at the homecoming of the Three Fires Festival, honoring the three major Indian tribes of Michigan, the Ottawa, Potawatomi, Potawatomi and the Chippewa. So, the Three Fires Tribes. All right, I will continue on with my journey. Cut to the video. So, unfortunately, a piece of my camera has broken, but I am still holding it. I can do it. I have found the statue of the chief. This is the chief statue and clearly he has a smoking pipe with his hand to the right. Honor to the chief. I'm not sure if he is Potawatomi or Bijwa or the Ottawa group, but this is a mound to all three of the peoples of the Three Fire Nation. In modern day Grand Rapids, Michigan. As I carry on and continue on the journey north. scary squirrel so I made it up here to the northern part of the Michigan Mitten I'll be right over here right before the UP this is called Mackinac City and they have some history about the Native Americans of the region the Great Lakes area including the two natural peninsulas forming Michigan the remains of the home law, homelands of the Anishinaabe people, the Ottawa, the Obijwe, and the Badewa Potawatomi tribes. Over thousands of years, the Anishinaabe have maintained a highly complex culture, valuing science, philosophy, religion, art, and government. The native language was still Anishinaabewoman, so. Potawatomi. And this is the story of how they came over here. Sailed on canoes. I don't know if they built the pyramids here. If they had any mounds, but the Straits of Mackinac are an area for the Abishanabi, Adejwa, and Obijwe. So the three fire tribes of Michigan, the Anishabik at the Straits of Mackinac goes back thousands of years. Various oral histories all passed down by oral and traditions of how they came into existence and relate to this area with the Mackinac Island holding a great deal of significance in their beliefs. The creation of the migrations are part of this ancient history and are well 
as the Anishabek navigating many turbulent waters to stay in this area. While staying at Mackinac, it was decided the Obijwe would go north, the Ottawa would stay in the Mackinac area, and the Badamadawi would travel to the south. As told, these tribes still live in these locations and their ancestors chose today. The lower peninsula is prominently Ottawatama and Potawatomi, while the upper peninsula is Obijwe. And this map shows that. So the Obijwe would go north, that would be this line. They were in Lake Superior in modern day Canada and Minnesota. The Ottawa would stay in this area, so this would be the Ottawa area. And the Potawatomi would go south, so that's why the Potawatomi are in Green Bay around. There's the Potawatomi Casino in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and around Muskegon, Chicago, and they would have went to Detroit also. So they utilize the Great Lakes as pretty much their highways for trading routes to the neighboring groups of the regions, families. They would travel hundreds of miles and they would go down the lakes in birch bark canoes like these. And they would harvest clubs, trade warfare, and they would fight the Muscadish and Iroquois people of control for the Mackinac Straits and the resources. The Straits were a natural meeting place for the native people to trade fish and establish villages. And then the Europeans came. The arrival of Europeans intensified the conflict between the cultures. So the French and English people came with different customs and they fought for control over the Straits. The Anabishabik, so the Potawatomi, would not give up their homelands for the foreign armies and they would ally with the French. The other ones, the Araiwa and Obijwe, they traveled east to fight the British during the Indian War, 1754 through 63. So back in the 1700s. Then they surrendered to the British in 63 and Chief Pontiac led the fight against the British and there's Pontiac, Michigan, named after him. The British built over a dozen forts in Michigan, Ohio, Wisconsin, Indiana, New York, and Pennsylvania. War of 1812 would be the last time the Potawatomi took up arms to protect their lands. Then Congress passed the Indian Removal Act of 1830, so a Trail of Tears. Thousands of native people east of the Mississippi, Mississippi yeah, I misspoke there, were forced off their lands and go to Oklahoma and Kansas. Odishwe and Obishwe were northern Michigan and in their efforts to avoid removal enter, entered into multiple treaties with the U.S. So 1820, 1836, and 1855, the treaty rights established the trust between the tribes and are the basis of many legal rights for the tribes today. And so that's why they have self-governance. And then Kanepama, the impact and his life. So after War of 1812, the new battle emerged. Uh, they would fight for their home in Michigan. Odawa and Kanepawa, they would pick up where his predecessors, his ancestors left off. Replaced the war clubs with new battlegrounds. He was born on July 12th, 1813 at Waganakising, just north of Harbor Springs. And he chose his cousins, some that, that lady, Margaret and Blackbird, to go to Catholic seminaries in Ohio. The leaders wanted to ensure that their future generations were well educated to meet the challenges. And they were chosen to study for the priesthood, Vatican and Rome, so they must have went to Rome. And Augustine returned to Michigan. He was 22, I'm only 24, cool. He was in English, 
He was fluent in English, French, and Latin, and his native language. And he had skills as an interpreter. He helped the, uh, the people, the leaders, negotiate the Washington Treaty of 1836. And that contribution led to the 1836 treaty. And the next decade, the Odawa avoided removal from their homelands in northern Michigan. So that is why the people still have this land, even after trying to be removed by the U.S. government. And the last panel over here is the Anishinaabeg, so the Potawatomi people. Through the war, civilization, policies, and loss of land, the people had overcome obstacles and still live in the streets of Mackinac today. They traversed the bands of the Indians, of the natives, and Salt St. Marie. That's, I'm pretty sure that's in Minnesota. Chippewa Indian now give governed federally recognized sovereign tribal land on both sides of the strait. So the UP and the Mitten part of Michigan. And they utilize their rights in the 1836 Treaty of Washington, D.C. to access natural resources, including hunting, a fish, and they have the waters of the Great Lakes. So, this guy's family, that's another family, and that's them fishing, doing stuff. But yeah, they entered heated disputes over the tribal lands in the 1970s. They made another treaty court ruling in 1979 that said they have the right to fish over here on the waters of the Great Lakes. It's important because the court ruling helped them get momentum from the Potawatomi bands and in Michigan uh, they seek to reestablish their trust relationship with the U.S. Today they are recognized as 12 Indian tribes, Native Americans, and each tribe is independent, sovereign, and a nation. So they grow and continue to contribute greatly to the economy, environment, and heritage of this state, Michigan. And here's some art. Those are some baskets, they're clothes. Looks like a hunting boomerang thing and some water thing. So, oh, that's a ball club. A black ash basket, leggings ball club and a ladle cool cool stuff and next thing I'll be back I'll be going to the wilderness state park let's go bike around see what we'll find there so that's a brief history of the local people in this area AC navigate out let's go Ran into a reenactment.
got pushed back into their village by the looks of it. stand. This is our land. You come amongst us.
Good morning, good morning. We are in Saginaw. Going to the Sandalac Petroglyphs and that's about an hour away. Gonna bring this along, enjoy the journey. So these are the Sandalac Petroglyphs. They have the different wildlife, floodplain forest. So this is 
the game area for catching deer and hunting. And the petroglyphs are in the center somewhere. And there are mer very many native plants in the area as well. each morning as the sun pushes away the darkness, making sure the Anishinaabe follow the teachings that were sent by the Creator. Magizi and Nina's job is to remind people of those teachings and to honor Kai Magizi, as well as to look east towards where the new day life and knowledge come from. Right here on top is a spiral, and that's called Bimarazwin, or life and all its meaning. So a person, as they go through their journey, they have many different physical forms, but their spirit remains the same. When someone's born, they're born in the center. And as they go through and lead a good and proper life, following the seven grandfather teachings, and having things like humility, love, honor, bravery, wisdom, not just towards other people, but towards yourself, that spiral grows. And it's there to kind of remind us how we're connected to everything around us. And there's a balance that should be kept and how we should always remember that in the things we say and do. Right, so we're gonna move down just a bit to one right on top of this. Things that would go on around us, especially in nature. 
The last one's going to be on the corner of the smaller part of the rock. This one right here. So you've got seven short lines on top, a line that comes down and around. There were three longer lines and a fourth shorter one that we can no longer see. And this is called Naganja Moen, or the Seven Fires or Seven Prophecies. These are prophecies given to the Anishinaabe prior to them migrating from the East Coast to the Great Lakes region. And these prophecies tell them how they'll have to follow the McGee Shells west towards the setting sun till they came to a place food grew on water. They're talking about the Great Lakes region and the wild rice that grows here. As they took that walk, they were to make seven different stops and at each stop leave some people behind. Those that got left behind were to create new tribes. And they create many of the tribes we know today. And they're also told of the coming of pale skinned people from across the great salt water and how many of their people would begin to fall away from their beliefs and their culture and follow a new one. But that one day younger generations would begin to bring back those cultures and languages and beliefs during the seventh fire, which is what we're supposed to be in today. Now they start their migration from the East Coast, go up the St. Lawrence River, stop at a turtle shaped island near Montreal, then near Niagara, Detroit, pass through this way, up to Sault Ste. Marie, and then have any questions at all. All right, well, if you see something I didn't talk about, you've got a question, feel free to ask. I'll have some type of answer, even if it's only I don't know. <laughs> uh, one question. Yeah. What is this long figure, like, looks like circle head, long body and two legs? What so this one, like many of them that you see on the rock, we unfortunately don't know what it means, just because those meanings have been lost or forgotten for the many reasons in history from boarding schools when children were taken out of the homes and kept away from their family and forced to speak a different language, as well as restrictions on languages and culture as, and people dying off from warfare and disease. Um, there are a couple that we don't talk about on here just because they're only meant to be heard by certain people. So some are only meant to be heard by men, others just by women, some only by members of the tribe. That area there just happens to be some. We just don't know what they mean. Could you explain that what we are in the, the seventh Fire that yeah. we were in right now? So the seventh fire uh, was believed to have started kind of about the 60s, 70s, right around that whole time with the civil rights era. And that's kind of when the uh, last restrictions against Native people were finally lifted. I want to say it was the Native Native American Recognization, Rec Recognizing Act, Recognization Act, something like that. And that's kind of when you started having uh, younger generations that realize, you know, the elders who happen to remember these languages or these stories because, you know, their family, you know, felt they needed to know them even though they went off to boarding schools or, you know, their family, you know, happened to teach them and they never went, that, you know, they felt that because they were getting older that those needed to be preserved. So younger generations started doing things like that as well as things like they've got language camps. They have a lot now to teach some of the younger generations as well as integrating it in some schools, uh, especially, uh, I think it's northern Minnesota has been doing a lot in one of the areas that I think it's got uh, University of Minnesota, one of the branches, the city, it begins with a B. Uh, even there, some of the residents who are not Native American, they form some initiatives to start having things kind of bilingual like they do um, in places like uh, Montreal where it's in French and English, except there it's in English and Ojibwa. So if you go to the hospital, you've got everything bilingual. Some restaurants and other businesses have this. So you're kind of seeing a bringing back of those cultures and you know those beliefs. Once that's supposed to have come back fully, it's supposed to light the eighth fire, which everyone's a part of. And that is where humanity now has a choice of a path between peace and love and one of chaos and destruction but essentially ends everything. So I try not to turn on the news too often. I'm not super hopeful, but I would like to say it will be, but I again, I turn on the news.
historical history of the, the Sanilac petroglyphs here in Michigan. sandstone so it's it's bedrock in most places in the state it's underground but yeah it's it's like your typical not that one yeah, it's like your typical sandstone you can pretty much just say that, you know eventually even with oh yeah and people even take will take rocks like this and use them to carve into other sandstone rocks and you wouldn't think that that would leave any type of lasting mark but it does and that's one of our problems we have you know, not only that and broken rocks as well as using Harder things uh, on a lot of our sandstone formations out on the trail. The only good thing there is there's no petroglyphs, but it's still all 290 acres, all 240 acres of the tribes who come here. Plus, it ruins the natural environment for everybody else, and who no upsets me? It's uh, weird that there's. Pictures to kind of just remind you of this 
story or more accurately almost like a book because there's so much to each of these. It's just kind of a memory aid. So with their oral history being, you know, it's being an oral history instead of written and with many people dying off from disease and warfare, you know, it's hard to say, you know, some of these could have been much older. We just, we don't know based on the physical record. No, it's great that there's the protective roof for the, since, it's a, since it is a soft rock. And it is good for, the, for protecting from like the rain and stuff. Of course, you know, you get raindrops in an open field hit much harder than if there's a tree canopy. After fires burn everything, you don't have those tall 300 foot old growth trees that kind of help protect it. However, the canopy, I'm sure, oh, did you guys have the introduction? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, so I'm sure they mentioned yeah, about the bats the, and everything. Oh, yeah, yeah, the bats are contrib a major contributor to some of the deterioration because of their areas where they like to hang out. Their droppings will just eat away at it. And across the top, it's actually getting quite bad because they'll get up into the ceiling, between the ceiling and the roof. In addition to their droppings deteriorating it, we walk on it. So it's just, it's kind of a cycle of a problem. They're supposed to be redesigning our pavilion in the next 10 years or so they say, and that's supposed to get rid of the bats as well as kind of have a way to open the roof up. That way we can kill off the algae that's growing on it, the green, but control how much light it gets so it doesn't grow moss and lichen like the rocks out there. Okay, definitely. definitely. But physically preserving it, personally, I don't think short of re-carving it, which is try getting a bunch of people we partner with to agree at the same time on the same thing. Um, it would be probably helpful if uh, these pictures, like take pictures, we could get uh, Photoshop them and put around so you, you could like more, more yep. visible. I completely agree, as well as I have suggested many times installing a kind of raised boardwalk, also, which yeah. would help with yeah. our tripping yeah. hazards. Yeah. Yeah.
Yeah, well, nobody's here. We keep things locked up, and that's, that's really what it is. is um, whereas during the summer, you know, at least my case, there's still people here. The gates are open. You can come into it. Otherwise, you know, it's locked up, and I get kind of house wrapped up to prevent snow and so stuff. So it's definitely house you know, wrapped one like point. colleges and universities, too. I've had Almost clay like over in Saginaw. Talk to instructors and mention, well, why don't you ever bring this up? And they're like, I, I didn't even know about it. It's clay like. Okay, you live over there, you need to come see me in the summer, and a couple of them have. It's no, it's it's not and it happens with a lot and I think it comes down to because there's so much. How do you prioritize this over that? But especially in places like Michigan where it's so kind of part of everybody you know, how can you not at least other than oh there were trees? Hey, thank you for saying everything on yep, the tour, and it was awesome. Loved hearing it. So. You're welcome. And I'll take a look at this one as well. This is the history of the archaeology. This is Sandwick Petroglyphs State Park. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Yeah, enjoy the rest of your day as well. Thank you.
to the wonderful people that showed the tour. The DNR, the Department of Natural Resources of Michigan, Michigan Archaeology Society, the Saginaw Chippewa Indian Tribe of Michigan, and the ZB Wing Center. So the Michigan Historical Center, so thank you all. I'm AC Navigate, you've been watching this. I'm gonna cut the video and I'm up. This concludes the tour of the Sandalag Petroglyphs for me and for the viewers.